Accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints. Just people. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We're going to be talking about the rules of acquisition today. It is the seventh episode of the second season of Deep Space Nine, aired back on the 7th of November 1993. Teleplay goes to Iris Stephen Bear, story credit goes to Hilary Bader, directed by David Livingston. In this episode, Grand Nega Zek assigns Quark to initiate negotiations with the planet in the Gamma Quadrant, but Quark's new associate is not what he seems. Just going to be me. I broke my promise. It's It took, what, 15 episodes for me to break a promise, but... I'm heading out on vacation next week, so in order to get a backlog, I had to burn through this one, and uh, Clay will be back for Necessary Evil after this, but I figured a better episode to do by myself would be Rules of Acquisition, because Necessary Evil is a little bit more discussable than that, so as uh, as is the new system here, I'm going to be using patron comments to springboard the discussion uh, about this one, so I'm going to play an audio clip, then it'll just be me coming back to talk about Rules of Acquisition. If you really want a hundred thousand vats of tulaberry wine, I can put you in touch with the right people. For a price, of course. Of course! I always said you were my favorite dozai. Now, um, who do we have to see? The Karama. Who's the Karama? An important power in the Dominion. Uh, the Dominion? What's that? Let's just say, if you want to do business in the Gamma Quadrant, you have to do business with the Dominion. So, patron Neil Brennan writes, Rules of Acquisition, as much as I was enjoying the awkward titillation of Brokeback Ferengi, I was about to give up on this episode. Quark works nicely in the main ensemble, but add more Ferengi, Ferengis, and I rapidly lose interest. It's kid show, TV-level stuff. Ear hair, that space lurch guy, and a funny staff with a brass monkey on the top of it. Shrugging emoji. But... I'm glad I stayed with it for the mention of the Dominion. The Dominion might be the most important part of this one, right? Um, And I guess we'll get to them afterwards. But in in my opinion, this is an episode that's really only memorable for the Dominion mention. It's the first time that they've been brought up into the show. And other than that, I pretty much agree with Neil here. I picked his comment first just because I I was watching this one just thinking that the, uh, the... Ferengi kind of remind me of Muppets in a way. Like the the tone that they always have is always this sort of weird comical thing. Um, and they, they're sort of goofy. You don't really take them very seriously. I don't know if that's a good or a bad decision on the production staff to make the Ferengi appear that way. Like Zek is the supreme leader of the Ferengi basically. And he it's never met with any fanfare when he goes anywhere. His ship that they borrow is basically like a Ferengi shuttlecraft like he doesn't have a an impressive ship which you would imagine being the highest ranking mafia godfather essentially if you consider the Ferengi to be a um like a mafia ripoff and not just a purely capitalist group they they seem much more in line with the mafia and if that was the case you'd imagine he'd have the grandest Ferengi ship and everything like that and he would just be swimming in wealth and everyone would be following around like tailing him other Ferengi would sort of be trying to leech off of him or strike up deals all the time you never get that it's always comes across like he's just sort of a weird old elf that's running around and he's got this servant like uh, Loxana Troy had and he's got his gold monkey as Neil says and his ear hair he likes to have that combed it comes across really kind of stupid on some level like the the Ferengi stuff never really works and I agree with Neil that Quark on his own is good when they pair him with other Ferengi, it gets really ridiculous quickly. Um, even borderline sometimes when they add Rom into the situation. Although I think that Rom as a character is more grounded and has more ways to go with the story in terms of him betraying Quark and like what that means, and or him agreeing with Quark or him helping Quark, or you can learn something new about him. Um, you don't really get any of that with Zek. And Quark, when he's paired with Zek, always comes across as a little bit less in control of himself, uh, less like in, he has less agency over his own character because he's always just sort of acting on this weird Zek plot. And he doesn't really do anything in this episode. He kind of becomes a bad uh, diplomat trade negotiator. He doesn't really accomplish his goals. He defends Pell at the very end. But 
it's inconsistent and unclear to me how he feels about anything that's going on. Um, and that ties into more of the overall theme, which is this idea that the episode seems a little bit confused about whether or not it's a comedy. And it's touching on material that doesn't feel like it should be a comedy, but it's coming across that way. And I don't know if that's to the benefit of the episode. I think it actually isn't. And Iris Stephen Bear always kinds of writes episodes in this tone. He wrote Captain's Holiday. And he seems to have this sense of humor that he likes whimsy, like he likes whimsical, light, farcical humor. But I was looking and he actually thought that um, he was not happy with how the episode turned out, calling it over the top and unsubtle. And he said the tone was off in places. Parts of the episode became a bedroom farce, and that's not how I'd envisioned it, which is funny because I always think that that's how he envisions episodes. Um, A lot of his stuff comes across like that. So I don't know if it is a Star Trekization of his script that turns it into that. Um, And going on, director David Livingston regrets directing the Dosi, I think it's Dosi, 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 comically, the uh, the goofy-looking aliens that they meet in this one. It feels that he should have portrayed them as a race to be taken more seriously. I think that was the conflict. Like, they, they play this episode as a comedy when the reason that you play it as a comedy is only because they don't want to talk about the Ferengi societal stuff, which is the meat and potatoes of the episode, This uh, the Pell character being you know hiding her the fact that she's a female and then revealing uh that later on and because you know, frangry women are unallowed not allowed to be a part of frangy society um and th- they bring all that stuff up and what's funny about that is the fact that uh where is it here actually holly mclaughlin writes rules of acquisition love quirk being forced to confront that a female frangy can be an excellent profit earner i'd agree that that's a like it's a strong it's a good idea for an episode. The problem is that they don't really go into it all that much. And it's only really paid the slightest bit of lip service. I think that the, what's funny about the Ferengi stuff is that it's always come across as sexist as it's intentionally supposed to, uh, as we move into the 2018 later, you know, 2010s end of this decade, as opposed to the mid nineties when this came out. Um, the sexist stuff has actually become more cringy. And I don't know if that actually works. I think it for, I think it works for the episode in some ways because it makes the Ferengi seem even more dated than they were back in the nineties when this came out. And still you're dealing with the kind of dated, uh, situations where like Kira, for example, puts up with Zek sort of smacking her on the ass all the time <laughs> and she gets upset by it, but she doesn't react to him other than yelling at him a couple times. And I think the last time she does it, she doesn't even respond to it. She just says like, I can't believe Dax likes these guys. And because Zek doesn't have anything on Kira, it doesn't make a lot of sense that she wouldn't throw him like over a table which seems more like the Kira response to that kind of thing so it's really dated in that that way where the Ferengi's sexist nature while it's more cringy is also not responded to in a way that you'd anticipate the characters to respond to in a real world situation at this point so I think that it always falls a little bit um flat there and because they're not willing to go into the sexist nature and um it sounds pretty horrible to be a female Ferengi really like they they don't they describe the the way that it is to be a female Ferengi and it sounds terrible but they don't really other than the fact that they're like oh no no females can make a profit that's against our ways um they don't really touch on it in any meaningful way. It doesn't really amount to anything. They don't have any, she doesn't, Appel doesn't undergo any kind of punishment. No one really cares by the end of it. She goes off on her own. It's unclear if Quark has feelings for her. It's unclear if Quark cares more about profit or the relationship. And also like the, the Ferengi profit seeking thing seems odd when you pair it with this females aren't allowed to, you think they wouldn't care as long as someone was making a profit. It's, it's, it's just kind of the hazy nature of what the Ferengi actually are which ends up leading to a lot of frustrating episodes like this where you, since you don't know what their society is really about other than the show keeps telling you that they're profit-driven, but they they also seem to imply that they're like a capitalist thing, but they're also um, trade merchants of the 18th century, like they're mercantile uh, people. They, they don't really have a streamlined uh, portrayal of what they're supposed to be doing. So I think that the... 
uh, the episodes featuring them never really know what to pay attention to because they want them to be funny because for some reason they think the Ferengi are funny and they also want them to touch on issues like sexism, but they're not the characters that are equipped to really touch on that. Uh, let's see here. Next comment. Rules of acquisition from Zam Nuclear Vessel. Always kind of loved this one, finding Pell great before and after the twist, and this increased once I realized it introduced the Dominion. I wish more stuff established her had been uh, had reappeared. As more stuff established here had reappeared, especially Pell. She could have saved us from the worst DS9 Ferengi scenes ever in Profit and Lace. Yep, I like Pell as well, too. Um, I wish the episode had actually focused more on that relationship between the Ferengi and the, the female Ferengi role in society. And you could still have the Dominion mention uh, because the plot would be exactly the same. It would just be a refocusing of what's going on. I'd have less of the Kira and Cisco interactions with people. I'd have less of uh, the Dax scenes, which are pointless. Um, and then after that, I just I would have focused it more on Quark's conflict there and maybe a conflict of Ferengi society, whether or not profit seeking, because Pell is clearly gifted at what she's doing why quark wouldn't be stuck in between the you know the cultural remnants of Fer- ferenginar whatever the planet is called where he's like oh you're a female you can't do this um it's weird to keep saying female over and over again but that's what the show calls them uh, and hu- hu- human um the cultural sort of artifact of that and the fact that he shouldn't care because she's so good at her job that her making money is good for him. I feel like that's where the episode really should have focused and attended not to do that. Join Mango says rules of acquisition better than profit and lace, which I guess you agree with Zam nuclear Wessel. We'll get to profit and lace when we get to it. Um, let's see. Should have printed this out. I apologize. Stephen Cobb says, Rules of Acquisition, a generally fun episode. It is nice that they're gradually introducing the Dominion not only to the crew, but to us, the audience. It piques our curiosity as the name keeps coming up more and more. They do do a good job of introducing that. The production team actually said that it was intentional to introduce the Dominion in a more lighthearted episode to be a head fake to the audience. Um, If you are watching this without knowledge of what's going to go on, the Dominion name drop kind of comes across as a one-off star trek thing you're never going to hear about it again it's such a generic sounding name well well I'll, I'll need to wait till like clay or someone is on to talk about the name of the dominion um but they gave them an ominous sounding name but they also didn't really talk about them outside of the fact that the episode treats them as the major trading force in the, the gamma quadrant so outside of the sinister sounding name you don't really learn a lot the episode is so lighthearted that you think it might just be abandoned after this and you'll never hear about it again Uh, But that won't be the case. I think they mentioned them three times in season two before they are revealed on screen. So we have a couple more mentions of uh, the Dominion to go through. Uh, Let's see here. So thank you, Stephen, for your comment. Uh, Let's see. Matthew Ross, are you next? Yes, Matthew Ross writes about Rules of Acquisition, a.k.a. Space Yentl. Now seeing this again, it's nice to know the house elves can get together and have some fun. I actually want me some sand peas. I think the sand peas come back, actually. And Vizini, I mean, the Grand Nagus is always enjoyable. And, of course, Pell is another throwaway. As for the Dosi decaf, and with this episode, we finally get the long-necked coffee cups. I didn't even notice those. Um, just the thing you need due to the heavy seas of space. They're so important that they're in Babylon 5 too, which is speculation of the theft between the two properties. I actually don't know about that. Uh, I know very little about Babylon 5, uh, but I digress, says Matthew Ross. The foreshadowing in the barest of stories on the Dominion. Yep, pretty much. Um, interesting note about the coffee cups. <laughs> The coffee cups are the the backbone of the uh, the Babylon Five DS Nine arguments about who stole what from who. I'm assuming, huh? Um, Kyle Barrett writes rules of acquisition. The episode had potential to deal with some interesting subject matter in a classic Star Trek style, but instead, as Ferengi episodes often do, it collapses into ridiculousness. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I wonder if I even call it ridiculousness as much as just poor. Like the, I don't know. It's not a terrible episode. I was pretty bored while watching it. But I, I think it's just, it's not focused enough on what it wants to talk about. And what it wants to talk about is only tangentially related to the things that are actually interesting about it. So I do agree with you that it, it had some it had some opportunities to make a good episode. And they're just like, you know what, never mind. It's a Ferengi episode. Throw the Dominion mention in and we'll call it a day. Um, And that's, you know, that's pretty much it. This The episode was originally going to be 
titled Profit Margin. It began as a TNG story, which is interesting. Hillary Bader pitched it as Pell would be a female Ferengi involved with Will Riker. Um, and then Crusher and Pell would become friends. Like, I guess that's the point of that episode. Um, that sounds terrible. This sounds a little bit better than that. But uh, as I started at the, the top of the show, it's really about this is the episode where the Dominion are introduced, and that's kind of the introduction of a identity in the Gamma Quadrant. Uh, a couple of writers here. Michael Pillar, I can remember that once we decided we were going to go deeply into the wormhole, that we essentially were forcing ourselves to decide what we were going to find there. So the production team is realizing that they want to go into the Gamma Quadrant and give it an identity that it was sorely lacking at this point. We've had some of the weirdest alien species come out of it, and they're all kind of goofy and poorly designed on on a base level, and they're not really thought out. They are just cardboard, paper-thin characters that are coming through to provide inspiration for an episode. I was Stephen Bear said, We felt that having done a year and a half of the show at the time that we had such a rich backdrop that we hadn't explored. What's on the other side of the wormhole? Is it just more space? Robert Hewitt Wolf, we just felt it was time to give a face to the Gamma Quadrant. Voyager was going to be wandering through the Delta Quadrant from place to place, meeting new people, and we wanted to make the Gamma Quadrant distinctly different from that by creating the Dominion, a sort of unifying anti-federation in a way to give it a completely different character. So we'll be getting into that. Um, And the last note about that, the creation of the Dominion, which at this stage was only a name as the writers hadn't developed any definite plans yet. So the, uh, I assume Bear says the existence of the Gamma Quadrant next to a DS9 would not help if the series, if it just remained an unexplored space. They did three years of that on TOS and seven years on Next Generation. We felt we needed to define that space. Um, yeah, we don't meet them. We meet the Dosi instead, who are ridiculous and look terrible. The Dosi resemble very strongly the this. I don't know if Michael Westmore was overworked or something, but his designs here are terrible with the um, these guys and the uh the, the alien gambling episode those aliens were really terrible move along home the design of those guys it's basically just like goofy 80s metal threat like not thrash but like arena rock outfits with face paint on it's it's really cheesy and terrible um the dosi are also kind of goofy and they seem vaguely german inspired like i don't know if the actors are really german or if they're just faking it but they're all ripped and they don't make a lot of sense. You don't really get it. They're supposed to be like these sort of volatile fighting traders, but they, I don't know. They, so it's like difficult for the Ferengi to deal with them because they'll get beat up or something, but they're also good at trading and they just want to make a lot of money. It's not really clearly defined what their, their whole deal is. I don't think we ever see them again. I think we're, they're mentioned, but they look terrible. Um, Anything else to talk about this one? I don't, I don't really think so. It's not a very strong episode. So I'm going to, um, play an audio clip then I'll come back give my final thoughts and we'll call it a day I'm sorry but it's time you learned that when it comes to accumulating profit women are as capable as men now do me a favor and don't tell anybody else I should go I put passage on an Andorian transport you could come with me I can't. I know. All right, so the final thought, final thoughts, final thoughts for Rules of Acquisition. Not a good episode. Uh, we went over everyone's, the patrons, uh, you guys seem to think that it was decent to weekly decent, I suppose. Uh, maybe 40% of you thought it wasn't that good, 60% thought it was an okay episode. I think it straddles that line. It straddles like a line between a two and a three for me. Um. I'm going to give it a two just because of how bored I was while watching it. I really don't like the Ferengi episodes in any way, shape, or form for all the reasons that I mentioned. This one is tough to get through, especially when you know that Necessary Evil is the next episode coming up. It feels like it's just kind of a placeholder. Um, it's not. It's not something... It feels very... It was pitched as a TNG story, and it feels that way. It feels like they're just moving away... It feels like they they kind of straddled the line between a TNG episode and the DS9 episode where they were using a TNG template to flesh out the Gamma Quadrant in this episode. And that's fine, but it still is not an interesting story to saddle 
with the universe building of DS9. Like the TNG stories just really aren't very good at this point. And you'll get a sense of that when we get to Necessary Evil. I keep bringing up Necessary Evil because we recorded it. I recorded that first. Um, that one will be out on time and there'll actually be someone on it. But there's a big contrast. Like if you compare this episode to Necessary Evil, that's the difference between where the show was in season one and where the show wants to get to uh, later on, DS9 I'm talking about. And once you see episodes of what DS9 is better at doing, which are the necessary evil type stories, it's hard to go back and be like, yeah, this is an enjoyable thing. This would have been a middling TNG episode. Um, and as a DS9 episode, it's really not all that interesting. So I'm going to give it a two out of five, I think. But thank you very much, guys, for listening. Thank you, patrons, for leaving your thoughts. It's always helpful for uh, when I have to do these things alone. This will be the last uh, one for hopefully a while. I, I know that no one really enjoys listening to them, but I had to get it done to get these things out. Thank you very much for leaving your thoughts. Thank you for guiding the conversation. If you guys want to support the show and you want to leave your thoughts about upcoming episodes, you can go to patreon.com slash the Penske file, a couple dollars a month. You can leave your comments. Um, I put a post up about the upcoming episodes and you guys can leave your thoughts and I'll read them online or on the, uh, the podcast. Otherwise the other social media are all there. Uh, if you don't want to support the show on Patreon, the best way to support the show is to rate us on iTunes because that is the number one podcast store. So it's always nice to, uh, get a rating up there. It'd be much appreciated if you guys did that. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Hook will be up tomorrow. No, Hook has already been up. Uh, so hopefully you're enjoying Hook on The Real Ripe and Real Rotten. Uh, and we'll be back with Necessary Evil in the next episode. So thank you very much, guys. Thanks for putting up with me. Uh, I Hopefully I chose the right episode to do by myself, which is Rules of Acquisition. And we'll be back with Necessary Evil after this. Thanks very much for listening. Appreciate it very much. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>